mind. Now you click on all get it. Yes, so we start uh, the lightning and talk session. So welcome back, everybody online. And uh, Kylie, uh, the floor is yours. All right. Hi, guys. I'm Kylie Huck, and I work at Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. And today I'm going to be talking about superconducting hyperdimensional computing um, and building accelerators for that. Um, so one of the main questions, why bother doing anything but CMOS, right? Everything is CMOS, fabrication is CMOS, and it's, it's a big hurdle to move to another technology. But the fact of the matter is, you know, slow down of Moore's law, we've hit the power wall. So it's just, uh, we're only gonna be able to keep up with the growing demands for increased computational power for so long. And we can't just keep building more accelerators. That's not gonna cut it forever. Um, so particularly for HDC designs with these really, really huge vectors, um, you pay a really high price for the large static power dissipation of CMOS. Um, Cause again, a lot of times these computations are quite sparse, but you waste so much power just with these, uh, you know, idling units. So uh, superconducting computing is really attractive for that because uh, there's no resistance so that you don't have that static power dissipation. Um, you do pay a cost for cooling because these things run at four Kelvin um, to the tune of 400 X. But even with that, you're generally beating CMOS by around two orders of magnitude. So that's still pretty big. Um, and then another big reason is pulse based computing schemes are a really great fit for hyperdimensional computing because it allows you to do pretty aggressive uh, area latency trade offs and encode vectors as pulse streams, which I'll be talking about in a moment. Oh, and uh, there is the paper on this work. So that'll be like pretty much where all of the material from the presentation is. Um, all right, so what is superconducting computing? Um, you guessed it, it's computing with superconducting elements. Uh, so our transistor is this little thing called a Josephson junction, which is represented with this little X symbol here. Um, and all it is is two thin sheets of superconducting material with a little uh, piece of non-superconducting material in between. And essentially what happens is it has this characteristic current, this critical current IC. And so some input current I... Um, as long as the current is below the critical current, it passes through with no resistance. Um, and as soon as the current exceeds the critical current, the junction switches to the resistive state and you get this pulse, which does look exactly like an action potential, which is pretty exciting. Um, but yeah, the idea is that you're computing with these pulses and these pulses are picoseconds long and um, micro amplimeters in terms of the uh, actual voltage. Uh, skip, I have many extra slides. <laughs> um, okay, so just getting down to how you actually, you know, create logic gates with this type of technology. Obviously with such short pulses, you can't say, you know, you can't do what you do in traditional computing where you have held high, held low signals. Because mm -hmm. um, the chances that your pulses are gonna arrive at the exact same time is like pretty much nothing. Um, so instead, we use these computational windows and some reference signals. So, you know, your clock. And here we have two data signals, X and Y. And we're looking at, um, you know, they're, we're doing computations within the span of a window. So for OR, we're asking, you know, did either signal arrive in this time? So here, obviously, whenever you have a pulse in either of them, you get an output pulse for the OR gate. Similarly for AND, you're looking for any windows in which they both arrived. And then again, just yada, yada, you have your, your traditional logic. But uh, a couple other cells that are rather non-traditional, although actually, I mean, this is basically an SR latch for those of you familiar, um, but we have several cells built around um, this superconducting element called a squid, which essentially traps uh, one of these pulses, which are, sorry, the pulse is also called a single flux quanta. So whenever you see SFQ, that's, it stands for one of these little guys. Um, so these, the squids are built out of two Josephson junctions. And what happens is you have a pulse arriving um, and then it circles the junction. It flips one of these JJs and then it will, Josephson junctions, and then induces this uh, flux through the ring. And so it's essentially trapped circling here until another pulse arrives and the other Josephson junction fires 
and the, the current starts rotating the other direction. Um, so once, and that's essentially all this gate is. So you have the S gate, or sorry, the, the S input, which is being stored, and then the R input, which is releasing it. So it's worth noting that, again, because once you've released this pulse, it's leaving from the output. And so if you get another reset input, it's there's not going to be another output until you see another input. Um, oh, yeah, that's just showing, you know, what I just said, where it, when it uh, fires and then you don't get it again. All right, so here is a related cell called the non-destructive readout cell. Um, same idea, except now we have this reciprocal output as well and this additional input. So um, this time again, S is being stored. When you see R, it triggers output on the Q star or Q quote. Um, and then when you see the C input, it's uh, on your traditional Q output. So you'll see those later. Um, a rather biological cell is this inhibit cell um, where you have S and I, and S is in, or sorry, I is inhibiting S. Um, so in this case, if the data signal S arrives first, oh, these are mislabeled. Oh, no, 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 they're not. That's fine. Um, then it's allowed to pass through. But if I arrives, it will block all signals until you see reset. So here we have um, X and Y. And um, the, the data signal is listed first and then the inhibit signal. So in this first case, we have X as the data signal and Y as the inhibit signal. So you can see since X arrives first, again, so time's going this way, um, X beats Y, so it's allowed through. But in this second case, after the reset, uh, Y arrives first, and so we see no output. Um, and then this is just showing it the other way around. So formatting hypervectors as pulse streams. Um, here you can see we have some vectors stored in memory. Um, and what we would like to get is the entire vector on one wire. So the idea here is, again, you have these, these reference signals set by some clock. And each window represents one element of the vector. So you're going to have a, you know, if your vector is n elements long, you're going to have an n cycle pulse stream to encode this vector. Um, so here again, just showing wherever you have a one in the hypervector, that's represented with a pulse in the corresponding cycle. Um, and then this is just some details for how we do this readout. Uh, you have a DFF array, so that cell I showed before, storing all of these values. Um, and then you have these uh, read lines, essentially, in a, in a temporal step pattern. And all of the outputs are merged together. So, you know, the each of the cells will fire in order of index, and then they're all merged onto a single wire to create this pulse stream. Um, and then how we do computations with these pulse streams. So the obvious example here is the calculation of the difference vector from our memory vector and query vector. Uh, this is just XOR. And as, again, as they're pulse streams on a single wire, you can just use a single XOR gate to do this. Um, so here, yeah, that just shows the computation. Um, and then this is probably very familiar to some of those in the audience. Uh, it's a the 2D language recognition uh, module from a very famous paper published, I think, in 2017. Um, I think, yeah, some of the authors are in the audience. But uh, the idea is basically it's for uh, European language recognition with letter trigrams. Um, and so here we have the encoding stage and um, an item memory lookup, which just has the seed vectors for all of your letters, and then um, permutation and uh, accumulation to, to create the profile vector. And then you have your similar, similarity measurement blocks, which each store one item from memory and do this distance uh, computation. So uh, for the paper, it was really a re-implementation of this design using the superconducting elements and um, pulse streams I've just described. So getting into the details, uh, yeah, that's the, um, or the, the, sorry, the, uh, the item memory. Um, so I'm not going to go into details, but um, okay. I'm going to keep the details a little brief because I think I'm probably pushing time, but um, essentially this is the accumulation element and the main detail or the main thing to take away here is essentially what happens is you have this big inductor and it traps all of the pulses that it sees 
And then you have a clock signal read it out after you've accumulated all of your trigram vectors. Um, and because the clock arrives at regular intervals, it's basically used to kind of um, push flux out of this inductor. And so what you get is a temporal encoding of the number of pulses stored in the inductor. So here, um, this is the beginning of the accumulation period. We've seen five pulses. And so this accumulator here will produce output five cycles following the start of the read. Um, and so what that allows us to do is use the simple inhibit gate that I showed before for the threshold which makes these, um, this is extremely expensive to do in CMOS, the accumulation and thresholding, but it's actually quite cheap with um, superconducting. Um, skip. Okay, so here is the distance computation and um, item memory node. So again, I'll, I'll spare you guys the details, but essentially you have, each node has an in, in uh, node item memory. Uh, which is superconducting. Um, and so you have essentially, again, like the same uh, right here. Okay, so this is the method that's used to do the readouts and pulse stream formatting in the whole design. So that's what's happening in this purple box. And then again, you just have your, with your memory vector and your query vector formatted as pulse streams, you just need one XOR. Um, and then we build this uh, TFF synchronous binary counter. And so you get a um, digital Hamming weight output at the end. Uh, I, will, I will skip this for now, but essentially, again, this is just showing the, the various stages for the computation. Uh, I'm skipping that. Uh, only thing to take away, this is kind of naive. Um, this was a first pass design kind of looking at exploring the superconducting design space, this can be made a lot better. And I'm going to talk about that later. Um, okay, so the methodology. Um, as an emerging technology, we don't have any uh, CAD tools for this type of technology. So it's basically <laughs> good luck, build your own tools. Um, so what we do here is you, you pick a technology in a cell library. The uh, Sunny SFQ cell library has been around, I think, since 1973, I want to say, and is probably one of the most prominent ones for this family. So that's what we used. And then using that, you design your circuits, the circuit, or, sorry, you design your gates and you do this on like a, a physical level. So you have a lot of descriptors of the actual um, Josephson junctions and their critical currents and all of these, these physical constants. And so then you uh, combine that with whatever your fabrication process is, and you simulate these gates at a really low level using this program called, called WR Spice. Um, so this is actually used to extract the gate timing and power parameters. Um, and then we use these in conjunction with, okay, yeah. So first you write your, your hardware level description, or sorry, your gate level description of the hardware using some, um, hardware design language. And then you also need um, your test bench. So basically like how you're gonna, um, what values you're gonna pass to the circuit to test it out. Um, and so I use PyRTL, which is basically based on Verilog if anybody's familiar with that. So using these together, you simulate the full scale circuit. Um, and then yay, results. Um, all right, sorry, I'm going a little fast because there's a part at the end I really want to get to. But uh, long story short, this was the actual, the first uh, realistically feasible superconducting machine learning method um, that's actually useful for real world tasks. Uh, it, the, the circuit is small enough to be realistically manufactured given current levels or current uh, SFQ fabrication limitations. Um, and it also has on-chip memory, which is really big because other approaches don't use this. Um, they actually need off-chip DRAM and converters. So they use uh, normal uh, semi-conducting memory to store their, uh, their stuff. So we compared against the CMOS design and honestly, the power results were a little disappointing. Um, we were expecting more power gains. Um, oh, here, yeah. So we only win with uh, ERSFQ is just energy efficient RSFQ um, with the ESR ERSFQ design. So um, yeah, I mean, I, I'll talk about that later. I really want to get to my last portion, but um, 
basically because of the lack of tools, um, we had to make some pretty aggressive assumptions not favoring our design, which meant the worst case activity factor. So you're assuming every junction in the, in the design fires every single cycle, which is a huge over assumption, um, especially for these, these sparse designs. But uh, even then it can be made a lot better. Like we used a rather primitive tree comparator. Um, so there's just, there's a lot of room for improvement for this design, um, especially in the power area. Throughput was really good. Um, this is comparing against the leading superconducting neural network accelerator. Um, so it's performance for a, a variety of networks are shown here. And here is superconducting computing. So this looks at a range of vectors. Obviously the latency is dependent on the vector length. So we're still winning even at quite large uh, vectors, even uh, just except for mobile net. Um, but beat it for uh, all the shorter ones. All right, so yeah, did mention some of this, um, but this is what I wanted to get to. Um, so something that I'm really excited about is looking at combining this pulse-based computing with temporal encoding. So the idea here is that values are encoded as delays. And what that means is that uh, minimum and maximum become first order functions and they're really inexpensive. It's just computed with or and and respectively. So distance computations are incredibly cheap. Um, so here you can see uh, we do encoding in time. So um, actually this is mislabeled, but here we have X is two. So it just arrives after two ticks. Y, this should say uh, five because it's arriving after five ticks. But uh, the idea is you can do addition with simple delays. And then again, this is showing or, which we call first arrival and uh, and, which is just last arrival. So again, here, like looking at X and Y, as soon as the first one arrives, this gate fires. And then when the last one arrives, the, the last arrival gate fires. Inhibit, uh, we actually borrowed from race logic to do cheaper thresholding. Um, so what you can do here is it makes the distance calculation incredibly cheap and low latency. Um, you can use the difference vector to set the delay path, um, essentially. So these little nodes represent um, a gate that can, if it receives input, delay an incoming signal by a single cycle. And so the kicker here is that you just have some you know, start computation signal at your, you know, time zero, and you set the delay with a difference vector. And then all you do is you allow your signal to propagate through and it will pick up the delay that is the distance. So not only is this a super efficient way to do the computation, but it also means you don't have to spend n cycles. You don't have to look at the whole vector to do the computation because it's not like you could do that for um, for the traditional method. You have to look at every element because you don't know where the ones are going to appear. But in this way, the wherever there's a zero, the signal passes through with no delay. So it's way way lower latency and um, incredibly cheap. And the real place that you see a big area and power improvement is in the comparator. Um, you can use this incredibly biological circuit, um, the, the winner take all circuit essentially, where here you have your um, item memory vector nodes. Well, that's uh, just what I call the comparator node. But basically each of these produce some temporal output. So they're shown here, all of their Hamming weights. Um, time is going this way. So this is the soonest one. And then you get this and then this and then this. And then um, what this piece doing is doing here, you're basically merging them all together. And then that serves as the inhibit signal to all of the Hamming weights. So this basically just selects the minimum Hamming distance and says, if anything arrives after that, block it. So all this does is allow only the minimum Hamming weight to propagate to output and win the class. So here we have, again, our four Hamming weights um, and then multiple input inhibit signals aren't going to do anything. But the idea is as soon as this one arrives, everything else is blocked. So you only get output on three. So this is a way, way more efficient um, way to do the computation than, let's see, than, oh, oh my gosh, so many slides. <laughs> then <laughs> this, oh, okay, I went all the way to the beginning. Find that. Then this monster right here. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, massive circuit, lots of latency, lots of power, lots of area. And I will just skip back here. Um, yeah, so thank you. Thank you.
Uh, so we have time for questions. Yes. Um, yeah, so uh, a couple of questions. Um, so, and I, I'm pretty sure that there's some of them. Um, so you, you mentioned that SEMA is not ideal for Kind of missed like the the, the why why that is uh, especially if you're looking at this new architecture that's just much. Yeah, so it, it again doesn't have to do with the architecture itself. It has to do with the technology. CMOS has a really high static dissipation. So like, let's say I have an AND gate and it's powered on, but I'm not sending any signals to it. You're still consuming about, you know, 60% of the power or something as if you were actually performing computation. That's a question about like utilization, how much utilization can you get? No, no, sorry. So the point is, even though it's even when it's idle, you're still consuming a large amount of power, which is really non ideal because it's for HDC, especially with such huge vectors. Also in CMOS, each vector element typically requires its own wire. So you're talking a massive amount of wires, a huge amount. Like often you also have these massive gate arrays. So, like um, going back, so this actually. This figure is from um, the HD as a nanoscale paradigm paper. So this is the, the CMOS design. And you can see okay. here, most of the design is these massive gate arrays. And so you have, even though your computations are very sparse, you're still dissipating a huge amount of power just by having these, these really huge gate arrays. Yes, okay. I, I, I missed, uh, are you using sparse hypervectors or hypervectors? <laughs> Well, I, this design uh, specifically uses um, the dense hypervectors, so like, uh, you know, half ones and half zeros. Yeah. The, our, our design for the search module is compatible with any sparsity, but in order to create the sparse hypervectors, you need to have a, um, a corrective unit after any binding operation to return the resulting um, bound product to the correct sparsity. So just because of the additional hardware, again, this is this was a proof of concept design, so we didn't add that. That's certainly future work. Um, but for the for the search memory, it's certainly compatible. Um, but just to get back to your point, the idea isn't that you know you're using a certain sparsity. Like HDC computations are sparse in general. The idea is still just that when you have these, uh, like in in CMOS, you're wasting power all the time even when you're not doing anything and for superconducting because you have no resistance you're just like you're not dissipating any power unless you're creating one of those little pulses um so you i mean you do actually so you have bias currents um against i didn't really explain that but essentially um you can't the the this this bias current is set by the physical characteristics of the junction or sorry, this critical current. And so what you do is you use a bias current to add just enough current against the junction so that a single SFQ pulse, because again, this is a set amount of flux, a single pulse will cause it to fire. Um, so basically that's how you tune it. So this does consume a, a small amount of static power, but again, it's just nothing compared to, to what CMOS dissipates. Okay. Um, and uh, then I, I guess the final uh, question is like uh, how is logic synthesis on 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 these on these gates and if, if you want to do a more complex operation like perhaps a, a majority or some some kind of if then else uh, like max operation like are there uh, are there tools for for actually uh, synthesizing the correct operations here. No. So that's, that's, uh, that's the kicker. Everything is done by hand. So, um, you don't have anything to generate hardware for you. Like you certainly have, like you can use papers, um, <laughs> look up designs that other people have made, yeah, but even on the software side, I mean, like when, when programming something on, on, on this, like, would you, like if, if you don't have a specialized circuit, like a, a slightly more general one, when, when programming in a regular HVC uh, fashion like, like we do now, how much translation they're needed to this and how much of that could be automated? So in the course of doing this design, I built a library. Essentially what you do is you write the 
you write the specifics for all of the gates um, and you parameterize it with these uh, these parameters that you've extracted from this circuit level simulation. So basically you do hierarchical descriptions that can then be called. So like I had descriptions for all of my primitives and then, you know, moved up a layer and built like memory arrays and then, you know, built the, the, the TFF counter. So essentially you write these all as modules. Um, the only difference is, you know, for, for CMOS, you can do something like say, I want to just invoke a DMUX and then, you know, it, it'll know how to do that. But in this case, you have to write your own. So actually I have like, yeah, I, I can pull up my scary Git repo, but uh, yeah. So the answer is no, there's, there's no tools on the software side and there's not really like the designs pretty much need to be done ad hoc. So. Yeah. Right. Uh, I am. Um... I have a suggestion that we, we uh, if there are other questions, and definitely I even have my own questions, but we, we take it offline, so okay. uh, so during the free time. Uh, so thank you, uh, Kelly, once again.